Um, good morning, and thank you for joining us to talk with International Space Station Expedition 64 flight engineers and NASA astronauts Kate Rubens, Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi. On Sunday night, Mike, Victor, Shannon, and Soichi, the NASA SpaceX Crew-1 crew, launched from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon Resilient spacecraft to the International Space Station. Their spacecraft successfully docked to the station on Monday evening, and they joined Kate Rubens, who has been living and working on board the station for the past five weeks. Their docking marked the start of the first crew rotation flight of a U.S. commercial spacecraft and begins a regular cadence of space station missions launching from the U.S. aboard commercial vehicles. It is so great to see you all on board. Um, we'll go ahead and start with any remarks that the crew would like to make and then take questions for them. For media on the phone, please press star one to ask a question and star two to withdraw your question if it's already been asked. With that, I will turn it over to the crew. Okay, thank you. Um, boy, I tell you, it is fantastic to be up here. Uh, the uh, the launch itself was was absolutely incredible. Um, that vehicle really gets off the ground, and uh, and so it was exciting all the way up. And the ride was was very smooth. So it's uh, you know I know we had a, a few delays along the way, but uh, we launched when we were supposed to, and and we got here when we were supposed to. So um, from uh, Crew One, we just want to say thank you again to all of the folks at uh, NASA, at SpaceX, the DoD, everybody that helped make that launch uh, successful. And uh, we are really looking forward to the next uh, six months up here on the International Space Station. Here. Okay, let's get started with Q&A. Let's start with Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Oh, uh, hi guys, it's great to see you. Uh, my question is for uh, Suichi. Uh, this is now the third vehicle that you've flown to space. Uh, I just wonder how uh, resilience compared to uh, the Soyuz and the shuttle. Thank you. Hey, Chris, uh, thanks for the question. For the record, uh, the Dragon is the best. It's a short answer. <laughs> and of course, each uh, vehicle has its own, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, peculiarity. But uh, I feel Dragon is really ready to go up. It's really, uh, it's fun to, fun to ride. And uh, two days in uh, Dragon is really remarkable memories. So I'm uh, really uh, happy to be here again. Awesome. Okay, let's go to Joey Roulette with Reuters. Okay, we'll come back to Joey. Um, how about Russell Pounds with Pacific Rim Media? Uh, good morning, folks. Great to see you. Uh, this is Russell. I'm calling from Alaska today. Uh, and a question for Shannon or maybe Victor. Uh, I understand you've taken uh, quite a few science experiments up to the station along with the many already in progress. Uh, which experiments do you think might be most surprising or meaningful to those of us back on Earth? You know, that is a very good question, um, and I'm not sure I have an answer for you at this time. Uh, we really haven't gotten into the experiments. We're still sort of getting organized, and so I may have to wait a few weeks before I answer that because I'm honestly not sure what we've got going in the next, you know, the next few months. Okay, let's go to David Curley with Discovery Channel. Hey guys, thanks for doing this. Uh, could you fill in a little more about uh, what the ride was like? How did it compare to what Bob and Doug said, the sounds, the vibrations? Uh, did it match up pretty quick? And Kate, what did you tell the rookie when he came through the uh, hatch there? You were uh, waving your arms. I'm just curious what you said. Thank you. I was so excited to see Ike's face coming through that hatch. Uh, we've been thinking about this moment up here uh, together with the, the two Sergeys uh, waiting for our four crewmates to join him. And I think uh, I said, oh, my gosh, you're here. <laughs> we, were, we were just really, really excited to see them coming through the hatch uh, and, and to welcome our friends to the International Space Station. 
Yeah, and in terms of the, the launch itself, uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning it was an exciting ride, and that really doesn't do it justice, to be honest. Um, Bob and Doug described it pretty well. Um, but to just when uh, you're sitting there on the rocket as it's going through the fueling process, you know, there's noises and vibrations, and it, uh, in many sense, it just, it, you can tell it wants to get off the ground. And particularly in those last uh, two, three minutes as uh, the final fueling's happening and, uh, and the strong batch retracting and things of that nature, it's, it's definitely ready to go. And it, it just it leaped off the, the pad. It was amazing. And, and right after we, uh, about 40 seconds into the flight, you throttle back a little bit, and you definitely noticed that. But then when it was time to get going again, it, it really picked up. And, yeah, and it was, it was really moving. Uh, staging is always pretty exciting, I think, on any rocket, and this one is no different. Uh, there was, uh, when, the, when the first stage uh, shuts off and, and separates, and then that second stage kicks in, you definitely know that as well. And then this just slow, steady build up in G's all the way up into orbit. Um, but uh, I tell you, we were, we were all very excited. Uh, we were, when we passed the 100 kilometer point, we all said, uh, welcome to space to Ike, because that's certainly a big moment. And I think it's probably worthwhile to hear what Ike thought of uh, his first ride to space as well. Yeah, it's a great question, and the short answer is it's, it was awesome. I could sit here and tell you for the entire duration of this conference uh, how great the ride was, but uh, the staging was dynamic. The G's on the second stage, the second stage is much closer to our spacecraft, so you felt it. It was much more up close and personal, um, but we accelerated for uh, several minutes, and so the G just slowly built in. It, you definitely felt it, and then when that engine cut off and we were in orbit, I mean, it's surreal. I've seen tons of pictures, but... Um, you know, when I first looked out, at the, out the window at the Earth, uh, it's hard to describe. I, there are no words. There are no words to describe it. It was yeah. an amazing once-in-a-lifetime feeling. All right. The next question will be from Marcia Dunn for Associated Press. Yes. Uh, Victor, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Uh, what was your biggest surprise about the launch? And having flown 3,000 hours and more than 40 aircraft, how hard was it to be hands-off the whole time? Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. That's a great question, Marcia. And, and how you doing? Um, so, you know, when I first started training for this 30 months or so ago, that was a big deal to me. I will tell you, on, on the 15th or, or Greenwich Mean Time on the 16th, it wasn't an issue at all. The, the rocket, the Falcon 9 performed superbly the way it was supposed to. Dragon performed superb. Um, we had some things to work through, uh, but we worked through it as a crew. And I tell you what, uh, the thing that surprised me the most, and it's interesting you reference, you know, having 3,000 hours and some combat time flying high performance jets, the G was not the highest G I've ever felt, but it was for probably the longest duration. Mm -hmm. And so that was a surprise. In a fighter, you can't hold, you know, four Gs for several minutes, and, and not, not most aircraft. And so that was a surprise. Um, and again, once those, uh, the second stage cut off and you're floating, again, I've been able to feel that for a few seconds, but to have that for an extended period was just truly amazing. Okay, let's go to Jeff Wynn with CBS Los Angeles. Good morning, Victor. Uh, thank you uh, for doing this. I hope you can take a question from me. Um, you know, I'm from your hometown. Um, earlier in the week, I got to speak to your college wrestling coach, Coach Cal, and uh, your department director at Cal Poly, uh, Dr. Walsh. And both of them said that they uh, literally cried when um, they watched the launch and you going up was like having them on your back. Uh, what's it like for you to hear, you know, your college instructors speak of you uh, with that much pride? And, um, you know, what are you hoping to, to share with uh, kids, um, you know, from this mission? Because I know that that's something that's very important to you um, as a girl dad. Wow. Thank you for that great question. Um, you know, a girl dad, a dad period. I just, I hope that this inspires people to literally and figuratively look up. I, I really think having something to look up to now, especially as we bring 2020 to a close, it's just something that we all need. And, you know, you mentioned two people who mean so much to me, and I could name a ton more, but, you know, Coach Cal and Dr. Walsh, my advisor in undergrad, were um, huge inspirations to me. And so to hear that they were inspired by this, I mean, you're about to make me cry. That, that brought tears to my eyes just now. 
I was fortunate to see a shuttle launch uh, when I was still flying test uh, missions in the Navy, and, and it did. It brought a tear to my eye. It was just such an amazing thing to think those folks are leaving the planet for, for a while. And it's hard, again, another thing that's kind of a, a life-changing event. So to, to share that with them was, was truly an amazing opportunity. Thanks for the question. Wow, now we're all crying. Okay, let's go to Tarek Malik with space.com. Uh, hello and, and good morning. Uh, my question is for the station veterans and for you, Kate. Uh, I, I'm curious, you know, this is a, the first time we've seen a, a seven member long duration crew. I'm, I'm wondering, does it feel extra crowded? Uh, are there lines at the galley and the, uh, and the, the WC? Uh, I'm just wondering what, what you're hoping with that extra person on board to accomplish in terms of science and research for the station. Thanks. Thanks, Tariq. That's a great question. And I would say it's crowded has got like some negative connotations. This is busy in a great way. There's energy up here. We've got people zooming by. You know, Hopper's been working in the glove box this morning. Somebody else is in another module doing science. Somebody else is on the exercise machine. So you can tell that there is just so much going on on the space station. And by having five of us up here now, we're able to really accomplish accomplish a huge amount of research. And so there's some level of maintenance that we always have to do on the space station. And so when you're just uh, one person like me, a lot of the time gets taken up just keeping this place running. Now that we've got all of us, uh, the amount of scientific output that you're going to see from this mission, I think, is absolutely incredible. All right. Let's go to Rachel Joy with Florida Today. Hey everybody, it was an amazing launch. Uh, thank you so much for uh, doing this today. Um, we're just dying to know how you chose Baby Yoda as the zero G indicator and um, how does he compare flying on the Falcon 9 versus the Mandalorian spacecraft? Thank you. Well, <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> The, um, you know, each crew, um, that's what the, the zero G indicator is a, has a long tradition that crews have been able to pick those out. And, um, and so each crew has that opportunity. And so that was one we, we talked about. Um, we had just uh, started watching the series and um, it's hard not to like Baby Yoda. <laughs> And, you know, it kind of ties in, I, I think, with um, the name of our spacecraft as well. We talk about resilience and, you know, it's been a it's been a tough year. And, uh, you know, the fact that uh, they were able to SpaceX and NASA were able to get our spacecraft ready to go, the rocket ready to go throughout this year, throughout the pandemic and all of that. Uh, the, you know, we were inspired by by everybody's effort to do that. And so that's why we named resilience. And we hope that it puts a smile on people's face. It, it, uh, brings hope to them. And, and so Baby Yoda does the same thing. I think everybody, when you see him, it's hard not to smile. And, and so it just seemed appropriate. Um, it seemed appropriate for our crew as well. Um, we like to have a lot of fun, and we have been having a lot of fun. Um, and so, uh, again, it was, uh, it was very appropriate. I think, I think the ride into space was, uh, was probably a little rougher than Baby Yoda was used to uh, compared to what he rides normally. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question will be from Nick Samuel with Vero News. Hi, everybody. Uh, this question is for Victor Glover. Um, I know that you talked about uh, your first space flight experience earlier. Uh, so can you talk about how it finally felt to, to make it to the International Space Station? Did you, did you have a sigh of relief or were you unnerved? Can you, can you talk about that? Wow, Nick, that's a great question, and you know, it's it's so many different feelings. It's hard to explain. It it really is hard to put into words the 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 awe of seeing the space station, even over our video system from Dragon, and then feeling the the soft contact, the slow deceleration as we made contact with the station, and then making full contact and pressurizing, opening the hatch, seeing Kate. All of these emotions. I mean, the happiness, the relief, but then knowing that we've got work to do and and wanting to contribute and also getting used to space. You know, I was I was very slow. My brain is constantly <laughs> trying to figure out where up is. And I don't know if it's because I'm a new guy. They made me sleep in the ceiling. So every time I pop my head out, 
the entire space station is upside down. So I just stay upside down as much as possible. But that, that I think requires extra processing. And so everything else takes me so much longer. And so I'm trying to push through that and get work done. But it is a, an interesting challenge that I actually find slightly amusing. So it's been a, a, a whole bunch of emotions. And honestly, I'm still processing it. I've been writing little notes to myself and things in my journal. And, and hopefully, I'll look back on it and be able to give you a better, more concise answer. But it is so many different feelings. Um, but, but excitement is, is definitely one of them. That's fantastic. OK, let's go to Mark Corot with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, good morning and thank you. I want to follow up on a question to um, to Kate earlier, and my question is for uh, Mike and Shannon. What what do you see uh, having five people in the U.S. segment now? What is your sense of the environment and and the future of having that many people um, aboard to do all the maintenance and research? Yeah, I can. Uh, I'll start off, and uh, I'll just say it's it's go time up here. I mean, uh, this, you know, we came across the hatch just a couple days ago, I guess, but it's it's been pretty busy since we showed up here. So I think uh, the the folks on the ground, um, all of the investigators out there, um, I think they've been waiting a long time for this moment, and and so they've uh, they've got our calendars full already. And I think um, it's a good thing. We are going to see just how much science can come out of this space station, and it's a lot. Uh, but it takes a lot of extra work, too, because, you know, there is limited space, there's limited comm capabilities, uh, there's limited video capabilities, and so you have to coordinate all of those kind of things together, and, and that's going to be challenging. I think it's going to take us a few, uh, a few weeks to get our feet under us and figure out how, how five people are actually able to, to work around here without running into each other the whole time and, and all of that, but it is pretty exciting. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, people have asked about whether or not we've got, uh, uh, you know, collisions on the exercise equipment or the WHC, but really it's the traffic jams that we have going through the modules trying to get from where we need to be from one place to the other. So it's definitely, um, you can tell that it's a lot fuller here instead of three people on this side, five people, but everybody's right, is we're going to get a lot of work done, which is really good for all the science that goes on in the world. Okay, let's take the next question from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Hi, um, a question for Mike Hopkins. Um, you described how Dragon performed as a spacecraft. How is it performing as a bedroom? Um, have you set up camp inside Dragon as you expected? And um, I know you had some temperature issues on the way up, getting it warm enough. Yeah, have you experienced that again? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and, and to be quite honest, um, I'm, I'm not quite there yet because the first thing that we had to do um, after arriving is we had to get all of the cargo off, and then we had to move a, a lot of emergency equipment on board as well, and so um, that took us a little bit of time to do that, and I didn't really want to try and get set up um, in Dragon until all of that movement uh, was done and, and I could kind of figure out where the right place to put the sleeping bag was and and the few items I'll take inside there. Um, you know, as far as the temperature, uh, they've, they've been very generous um, <laughs> and kind of dropped the temperature down a little bit right where we are. And this is, happens to be where the other uh, crew quarters are. And, and so that's to make sure that, that our um, that resilience stays cool for me. It's probably been a little bit chilly, uh, but but I've certainly been comfortable. <laughs> we're, we're probably going to have to talk about the temperature a little bit more here, uh, but but overall, I, I think it's going to work out just fine. Um, you know, it is a it's a roomy vehicle, and and so um, you know I'm looking forward to to the next six months, um, and uh, we'll see. Uh, probably it's going to take me a few more days to really get settled in. All right, let's go to Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Hi, Stephen Clark for Space Flight Now. I want to follow up on my uh, earlier question from Chris Davenport for Subichi Noguchi. Um, what makes Dragon the best, and can you give us a little uh, window into life aboard the ship for 27 hours on the way to the space station? And how cramped is it compared to uh, your experience with Soyuz and Space Shuttle? Thanks. Well, uh, my other crew member already described, but uh, the Dragon was fun to fly. It's uh, it's really kind of uh, 
uh, they wanted to go, Dragons really wanted to go to space. The, the engine was really crisp and clear and the feel the vibration and definitely defies the gravity and it brings it up to space in a matter of uh, nine minutes or so. And, uh, and the difference mainly is the, the feel of the, all the plumbing or the, also the fueling uh, that you actually feel the, the, all the, uh, the liquid, uh, liquid oxygen going into the tank uh, a couple minutes before the flight. And also the, the feel, the thruster, vibration, sound, and also the small uh, uh, ori orientation controlling jet. It's, since I'm sitting by the window seat, I feel the jet is firing jet right back to my head, which is actually a good sign. So uh, uh, obviously this is, uh, feels uh, like you are actually inside the dragon uh, bringing us up to space so that was a quite a feeling okay let's take the next question from Jackie Goddard with the Times of London hello and congratulations on another successful crew dragon flight you all make space flight look so easy but we know space is hard what would be your best tip to future space travelers um, about how to prepare for living and working in space, particularly those who may not be career astronauts? Uh, I guess basically my question is, is there anything important that Tom Cruise needs to know? I think if uh, people are gonna come to space um, and not be career astronauts, I think the biggest tip you could have is to be organized because if you're not organized you're going to lose your stuff in no time flat and you will that will make life really hard so you've got to be well organized to be in space okay let's take a question from joey roulette with reuters Hey, uh, I just wanted to follow up on the bedroom Crew Dragon question. Um, was there any competition for who gets to sleep in Crew Dragon? And Mike, since that'll be you, um, what, what, I guess, will your sleeping arrangement look like and what kind of tests and data will you, will you plan to get from that? Thanks. Yeah, um, we were talking about, you know, if you know rock, paper, scissors, there's also another version <laughs> called uh, Gunman, Gorilla Man, Karate Man. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, actually, um, you know, there was a tradition I, when the shuttle used to, to come up and, and bring uh, uh, components and supplies to the space station. I think the commander always ended up sleeping on, on the shuttle, um, and it just, it just felt right that that's uh, where I was supposed to, uh, to go. Um, and, and so, you know, we talked about it as a crew a little bit, um, and, and everybody was... Uh, you know, everybody would be willing to sleep wherever, right? You're in space, and so you're not going to complain. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to complain uh, about about where your sleeping quarters are. But uh, so, um, in terms of, you know, what we're going to get out of it, uh, you know, most of the time while we're we're docked, uh, Dragon is going to be in what we call a quiescent mode, and so it's completely powered off. Um, and and so, really, I think one of the things that that I'm becoming more conscious about as I'm as I'm spending more and more time in there. Is I don't want to I don't want to do anything to, to damage anything as I'm going in and out and so um, for 160 or plus days 200 days whatever it is that we're up here and I'm using that as my bedroom it's also what's going to get us home and so I want to make sure I don't do anything to compromise that uh, while I'm sleeping in there so I will probably spend a lot more time outside the crew quarters than uh, if I had or outside Dragon than and if I had one of the crew quarters that are in here. Uh, so I think that is that is an important piece of it that I, I don't ever want to forget. Okay, let's take a question again from David Curley with Discovery Channel. Uh, one more item on that, Mike. Uh, are you looking for them to send up some more quarters? Uh, I've heard them called uh, if they're attached to the floor of the ceiling. Uh, coffins, as you float over them, they kind of look like coffins, phone booths on them. And Soichi, could you talk about what your flight and John Young mean to you? You've accomplished uh, what your hero, your mentor, did. Okay, um, I guess I'll start. Yes, there is a, there is a plan uh, to have another crew quarters on board. It's called actually Casa. Um, and and so it just it didn't make it here in time. There is a possibility that that it might show up uh, midway through, 
um, the the expedition. And so, if that is the that is the case, then I will um, be moving out of resilience and and into that uh, crew quarter. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that's a good thing because I, I think we want to just make sure we always keep our our uh, return vehicles in pristine condition. And uh, and so anyway, there is a plan, just not sure when it's going to actually make it up here for that other crew quarters. Yeah, again, uh, I'm very humbled and honored to, to fly three vehicles uh, uh, after Mr. John Young and also Warri Shira. But the good thing is uh, many more is uh, ready to, to follow. Actually, in five months from now, the crew two, they have another uh, two more astronauts who fly the third uh, kind of space vehicle. And the race just begun for the who's going to be the first one to fly four different ones. <laughs> so watch out for that. All right, let's take another question from Jeff Wynn with CBS Los Angeles. Hey, Victor, uh, thanks for uh, doing this. Uh, one more question for you. You know, in recent days, you've talked about social justice um, and uh, you've talked about the need for kids to go into science. As you are circling the earth every 90 minutes, what has that done to your resolve in terms of social justice and uh, the debate over extreme climate here on earth? Yeah, that's, you know, Jeff, that's a, a great but very, very large question. Um, I'll say this, if anything, it strengthened my resolve in, in all of those areas because I believe that, you know, what what I've said and what I've tried to work for is just what's right, to, to, to be honest and, and upfront with people and then to work for what's right. And I think that doing the right thing is always in order. So, um, you know, looking at the planet from this perspective, actually, I, I went almost a full day up here before I went and looked out the cupola in the daytime to see the Earth and in these beautiful land masses and oceans without lines or words drawn on them and um and also to look out at, at dragon it, it's it's beautiful uh but it, it just it just heightens an awareness that you know the planet needs protection that human life needs protection uh and and we are the ones who have to protect it all right i think we could talk with you all day but unfortunately that's all the time we have for questions thank you so much for um, your time and for your answers today it was really great to talk with you um, we will continue to keep up with your mission online at nasa.gov station and by following the station and nasa sites on social media thanks for joining everyone thank you everyone